Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Like Perul said, we usually, um, London Writers Salon have been hosting monthly meetups with some kick-ass author authors um, every month. Um, and we've just had the most incredible sessions. And obviously it was without a doubt, as soon as we turned our program digital, we knew that we wanted London Writers Salon to be part of our digital program. Holly Bourne was one of the amazing authors, one of the ones that I was most excited for when we first started collaborating um, to lock in a date with. And I'm so excited that we finally got this off the ground and it's digital and we're all in, we're all in a Zoom room. Um, and yeah, you're, you're in for a treat this evening. And I also think that with everything that's going on, this is the perfect, perfect time to kind of sit back and think, okay, well, what, what do I want to do? And um, you might be in a job that is really great, but you kind of want to work out a side hustle or work out something else you want to do. So London Writers Salon is exactly where you need to be. Um, we also might have some people from LA because I know we've got quite a huge uh, Albright have a quite a huge LA audience so um, if you are in LA and it's 8am they're welcome uh, <laughs> welcome and if you are in any New York and Berlin I know we've got some audience there or around the rest of the UK um, yeah we're just really pleased to have you it's just some etiquette um, please if you aren't speaking um, keep your microphone on mute um, it's I've pinned Holly, so you can actually, if you cool. if you go on to speak of you, you can pin pin Holly. Just see, <laughs> she's going to have a, a a she's a fount a fountain of knowledge this evening. Um, but otherwise, gallery view is pretty cool as well because you can see everybody in the room like we would do in real life. Yeah, I'll just uh, it's it's great to see everybody here. I can't believe we've got sixty people here. Fantastic. Um, and and growing obviously i can just see i'll hand over to Pearl and matt now they are awesome and that you're in good hands have a lovely evening thank you so much courtney you, for Carl. those who've just joined us welcome uh, i'm parl and i'm matt uh, so we are the london writers salon we we believe in um writing but we're we're medium agnostic so if you're a novelist or a non-fiction writer a poet a screenwriter a playwright a songwriter uh, we welcome you equally. Um, we're, we're here to uh, let Matt continue. <laughs> yeah, so each month we sit down with a writer that we admire. And today we have Holly, the wonderful Holly Bourne. Um, and we like to explore and want to explore and, and learn from them both how they've uh, uh, grown a writing career, but also talk about the craft of writing. Uh, and why writers, why writing? Well, we think writing matters and writers matter. Uh, we have the power to connect, the power to transform not only the people around us, but ourselves, uh, and especially times like these. And so our aim is to help writers like us, like you all, write more and more often with more success. And this is one of the ways that we try to help do that. And during the lockdown, what we're doing, for those of you who have just come in, we're hosting a daily writers session in the morning. So we have that. We're going to be doing two interviews a month with Albright. Um, and we also have office hours and online masterclasses with expert agents and editors. So you're welcome to join all of this. Yeah. And so tonight uh, we're interviewing Holly and both Parul and I come to this interview from two different perspectives. Uh, Parul comes to it from the traditional publishing world, uh, now working as an editor for YA, nonfiction and thrillers. And Matt likes to say that he's a scrappy writer. So he has self-published um, a travel writing book. He's a blogger. Uh, he facilitates at Escape the City. He helps people transform um, their work into creative work. And he is sporting a very fine survival beard. If you meet him, if you've met him before, it's not quite as, uh, <laughs> as thick as it is right now. Uh, and so a little bit uh, of how this will work tonight. So uh, we'll interview Holly. So Pablo and I are coming with a bunch of questions that we want to ask her. Uh, and so we'll do that for roughly about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the room uh, for you all to ask questions of Holly too. Um, and so let's, let's dig in. And I guess the first thing, because this is unique, one of the things we like to do is hear who is in the room. And we have a wonderful chat box. And so what we'd love to do is in the chat box below, there's a button that says chat. Just type in the chat box, where are you calling in from? And what are you working on? Are you a blogger? Are you working on a screenplay? Are you YA? Um, maybe you're just getting into writing. So just in the chat box, type where, where you are right now, where you're calling in from and what you're working on. A special shout out to Gisela, who's called, it's 4 a.m. I believe in Australia. What? 
Wow. <laughs> We're very impressed. Just like, it is That's still in her A lot her of world. London, <laughs> Italy, exciting. Paris. Oh, this right. is making me feel very connected to the world. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so lovely. Great. Hilary from LA, excellent. Oh, fantastic, LA. Sounds very exotic to me, LA. Yeah, oh, and Kayla too. Adele in Paris, great. Well, welcome everyone. This is a really, really wonderful opportunity to, to have a little community in these times of uncertainty uh, and to, to talk to someone um, who, frankly, is uh, very admirable and, and uh, maybe living a life that some of us might want to live as a, as a published and uh, successful author. Um, yeah. So let's, let's get into it. And there's so much we could say about Holly. I um, obviously had to, I've been, I've been following you for years, but, and there's so much I could say about you. You studied journalism, you have been a journalist, uh, you worked for a youth charity where you're an agony aunt um, and, and gave relationship advice. And you were inspired by some of the teenagers that you spoke to and you started writing YA. And you're very well respected in YA. Anyone I've ever spoken to in the publishing industry knows and respects, respects you. Okay. And the Spinster Club series uh, that you wrote has won awards, uh, sold very well. And you've started to write for adults. Your latest book, which I would love a show again of your cover because I do think yeah. it's beautiful. This is the proof. <laughs> the latest um, book is called Pretending. And um, it's a really interesting look at the world of dating. The character is called April and she's, she wants to find love, but she doesn't think she has what it takes. She's not perfect in the way she feels she should be. So she takes on the persona of Gretel. And Gretel's perfect. She knows what to say. I thought some of it was like advice, uh, like the perfect things you could say on a date. I loved it. Um, she knows what to say. She's never anxious. She's never awkward. She'll, she'll do it in any position because she knows that's <laughs> what you should do. Um, and she's never been raped. She's never had any abuse. And when she meets Josh, who she falls for, she doesn't want to tell him who she really is, but she has to navigate that. Um, and I think what I really admire about your work is that you're so honest and unflinching. <laughs> and you talk about what really matters, which leads us to our first question, which is a very real topic, which is where we are right now in this strange corona lockdown time. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your writing. But if you can show us your writing space, but if you can't, that's fine. H how are you coping at the moment? How are you writing? How are you motivating yourself and staying sane in these I uncertain times? <laughs> I feel like this huge pressure to to inspire everybody in the room but then I've made my career on telling the truth and the truth is I have not done very well out of this lockdown I creatively it has uh caused some blockages for sure and um, which is odd because I used to be a news journalist and I've always put my kind of high levels of productivity um down to that training which was you can't wait for the news to show up if you've got you know a, a a daily deadline you're just having to write and write and um, so that's always prepared me but yeah lockdown has slowed me um, and I'm trying to be kind to myself about that and I'm just trying to be like cognitive load wise there's a lot going on here like I'm living through history we all are we're sitting here digitally because none of us can leave our houses the news is terrible our prime minister is in intensive care and so I'm just trying to be kind to myself about the fact that um, creativity is not coming naturally. However, I've tried to do at least one thing a day um, and that is helping, even if it's just half a page. I've set myself like a bare minimum of, which is like the barest scraping the margarine tin, <laughs> like, you know, of minimum where I'm like, okay, if I achieve that, that's something considering the world outside is terrifying. And so I've scraped through my bare minimum and some days it goes up, and some days I am just going, okay, off a page, that will do. Um, so yeah, be kind to ourselves, I think. You don't, I yeah. think people who want to use this time to write a novel, that's amazing. Um, but if you're really struggling to and feeling really annoyed because you're going, I'll never have this time again. Like, this isn't, I don't have to commute, I don't have to do this, I don't have to do that, I don't have to socialize. I should be writing the great American novel, the great British novel. Just, <laughs> like, don't beat yourself up. You're, I wrote almost all my books on a commute train, <laughs> working full time. You know, you can forgive yourself if you do not use the world ending to its full potential creatively. Mm. 
And how, so you mentioned uh, being kind to yourself. So in addition to kind of giving yourself a low bar to hit every day, what else are you doing to be kind to yourself? In this kind of lockdown time? Yeah. Um, well, it's been, I was telling you just before we logged in, I've actually had Corona um, for the past two weeks. I've been fighting that. Um, and so that just requires a lot of sleep um in my case i've been lucky to have it mildly but even mildly yeah like wash your hands you don't want this guys it's not fun hmm. <laughs> um, i really thought i was going to be one of those smug people who jogs and is basically <laughs> a vegan and therefore i'd be fine and then the virus is like i don't give a shit that you're a vegan i'm gonna make you sick <laughs> so i've just been sleeping a lot um reading books i really love um where i'm just really plot driven books which just aren't too challenging in their kind of content so I've been reading Marion Keyes's new book Grown Ups and that's just been like vanishing into a hug and um, so I've just upped my reading and one of the things that I always give in terms of writing advice is if you want to be a writer you should be reading as much as you're writing and if you're actually struggling to write at the moment just up your reading because um, that is going to help your writing so much and so I've just been kind of going, okay, you're struggling with writing. So just read books of people that you love, who you admire, because through osmosis, you'll be absorbing their craft into you. Um, a little bit like that evil person in the Heroes TV show. <laughs> we believe that, you know, you absorb the best bits of the writers that you like by reading. So yeah, I've just been kind of t reminding myself of my own advice, which is reading is just as good for your writing as writing is. Oh, it's beautiful. Thanks, Holly. Um, so you're an accomplished author, even if you are having a hard time putting words on the page right now. Um, but I heard once, I was listening to a, a podcast with you, and you mentioned that you were taking evening counseling uh, courses to be a, a trained counselor. Is that still something you're doing or that you were doing? And, and if so, I guess I was curious that that choice, because uh, you're an accomplished author, but you're training to be a counselor. I was just curious, where does that fit within your journey as an author? It's so, um, I spent five years alongside doing my YA fiction, which is what I started writing, um, working for a youth charity and helping people, um, which required going on some training courses, understanding a lot about psychology and mental health problems and stuff which, and helping people, um, stuff which informed my writing without meaning to it wasn't like I was you know just helping a charity to like drain our users for content <laughs> you know it's like I wanted to help people but um and writing was always my hobby and it, it took five years of working full-time and writing full-time before I could make the jump to become a full-time author and I found that I missed having a hobby and it's odd when your passion and your hobby which is writing becomes your job um it, it's you feel like the luckiest person in the world but it can sort of you know take the edge off the joy and also your writing and I'm sure lots of people in the room would feel this too like writing's always been my identity like I write I'm a writer but then uh, when that's linked to how you make your rent and, you know, mm. um, yeah. and like you, you get like a, you know book sales doing well or not doing well and it, all that there was just a lot of noise and I was like realized I needed something else like I needed more identity yeah. um and so I've kind of swapped from helping people as a job to writing so I was like okay I wanna I love my job and I love writing but there's something missing and so I decided to yeah train to be a counselor which takes a very long time and is very hard but oh my if you want to be a writer like reading any book about psychotherapy psychology is just in terms of character and understanding why anyone that you're writing about why they behave the way they do what their flaws are it's just it's, I didn't mean it to help my writing I was doing it because it interests me and I want to help people but it's just been the, one of the best trainings I'd like to tell anyone to do like a level two evening class in psychology if they want to help their writing because it will just make your characterization just on another level. And that really makes sense because I was saying to Matt earlier that one of the things about your writing, because I, I read a lot and there are characters that I like in other books, but with your characters, there's a certain, there's a nuance. You, you, get, the, you get insight that I haven't seen elsewhere. 
And I find, I, I'm like, how does, she, how does she do it? And now it's really interesting to hear that actually you really are delving quite deep into people's psychology and that's how you're bringing it out. Mm, that's a really good book that I can recommend that I'm sure lots of you have read already, but it's called The Science of Storytelling um, by Will Storr. Have you guys read it? I've, I've read it and I've recommended it to anyone. Oh, and it's beautiful, yeah. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And Great. he kind of, um, like, he basically comes at how to write a novel from the perspective of the science of neurochemistry and psychology. Mm -hmm. It's just brilliant. And when I read that, book which I only read a year ago because it's quite new out I understood my own craft more I was like oh okay like this is what I've been doing I didn't realize that was that was what I was doing because <laughs> I, mean, I love to be the term scrappy writer that's what I feel like I'm always just like just tell stories and hope for the best and haven't been classically trained in how to be a novelist or something but it's yeah understanding people and being really interested in what makes a person tick what the difference between their inner self, outer self, their ideal self, their perceived self, all that mess that goes in, that boils under all of our skin. Like that's where the stories come from. Mm. I, I wonder if for a moment, you, you touched on that you were working full time for five years while you were writing. And it was only after those five years that you transitioned to an author full time. And I guess because a lot of writers might be in that place that you were, where you were working full time and writing on the side. I was curious, what did that look like for you? What was your, your writing schedule, your work schedule? You mentioned writing on the tube or on the commute. Um, is that when you wrote or can you tell us a little bit about that time for you? Yeah, I um, yeah, wrote my first five YA books around a full time job when I was commuting in London because charity work doesn't pay well, so I couldn't afford to live in London. <laughs> so I had to get on this miserable train. But like lots of commuters, I worked out where to stand, where the doors opened, where I might be able to get a seat, like all that kind of, you know, elbows out. Um, <laughs> and had my teeny tiny little laptop um, and would just yeah, sit and I would not, and this was before smartphones, um, so you didn't have the internet to distract you on your phone, but I would say now if anyone has a commute that where they can sit with a writing, like put it on aeroplane mode, because I did just have 42 minutes from where I lived to London Bridge and 42 minutes on the way home. And I just went, just do it. This is the only time you have all day. You'll be knackered by the time you get home from work. So just do it now. And don't worry about it being rubbish. Don't worry about how dreadful it is just get it done like you can't mend the blank page and so I would just keep going and it's amazing what you can achieve in a commute like I wrote five books on a commute 42 minutes each way every day if I was being treating myself I wouldn't write on the way home I was like oh I'm just gonna stare out the window <laughs> as a treat but um, <laughs> yeah but it was you know I, I think anyone who wants to be a writer for a living which I'm sure is a lot of people in this room and it's amazing and I highly recommend it and it's like you should you know I really believe that anyone in this room can get there but it's a slow journey and then one of the things my agent always said when I got my first deal she was like you will not even be able to think about giving up your job until at least books four or five like there's this kind of people I think are waiting for this lottery ticket yeah right the elephant where you get into a bidding war and stuff but for most authors like myself like my first advance I couldn't have lived off that <laughs> it wasn't life-changing money it wasn't even a yearly salary it was nice but I was so excited you know I had to financially keep going but you build a readership and you build and build and build and then and that's what you want anyway you don't want to just write one book that soars and then what are you doing five years later you want to build a readership so so, right, and you've done, you've done that. You've built a brand, like a, almost like a brand. Sometimes in, in our, we do a, a masterclass on pitching agents and we talk about how agents are looking for that, you know, if someone says Holly Bourne to, to one of your fans and I say her latest book is coming out, they'll want to buy it because they've, I mean, I want to buy everything you write, <laughs> everything you write now because I've, I'm addicted to them and that's what you've managed to achieve. Okay, but that's, um, oh God, how old am I now? That's 10 years in the making like wow. getting to that point you saying something that wonderful to me that just makes my belly just like oh <laughs> you know it was a decade um and for half of that I was yeah sitting in my office loving my day job but you know thinking 
this isn't what I want to do. I want this, I want this. But it's patience, patience and just getting the words on the page. Yeah. Write them, write them now. <laughs> uh, I, 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 no, I was just going to say five years to overnight success. <laughs> right? well, five years just to like be able to just about manage living full time. <laughs> and then another five years, you know, and you still worry if you're creative for a living, like, oh God, you know, are people going to let me do this forever? That's a big ask. <laughs> so be constantly terrified as well. I don't think the fear ever goes away. Um, and that imposter syndrome, I have that all the time. I'm always like, why are all these people turned up listening to me right? I don't know what I'm doing. This is just luck. Like, but I, I believe that every writer that I admire has that. And, and the, to me, the real work is overcoming that and still going, shut up, I'm going to write anyway. Yeah. I have a question for you. I think, I think that that's wonderful advice. I, I think it's really inspiring. Um, I'm curious about your, your, work, your, your work as a journalist as well. Did you... How, like, you know, we have a lot of people who come to our events who maybe dabble in both. What do you see as the difference? Have you chosen to only be a, a novelist, or would you ever go back to journalism? What do you see as the advantage or disadvantages of? Um, I, I hated being a journalist, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, especially in news, journalists. I was at a newspaper for two years and I just didn't have the temperament to deal with that much misery every day um and the kind of it's quite a cutthroat world you're kind of trying to race other people to stories against your rivals all this sort of just I'm just not like that I'm just very <laughs> kind of an, an empath and <laughs> want everyone to like me and it's just that just does not go down well in the news I'm just crying in the bulk most of the time um, <laughs> But I think journalism is good at, I really believe in a free press and, you know, telling the truth and getting to facts, especially in a lot of fake news. Like, I really believe that, but it just didn't suit my temperament. And to me, I love fiction because I, to me, and this is an opinion, is not a truth, but to me, fiction is the most powerful way to change somebody's mind, um, the most powerful way to seed positive social change because it's an irreplicable act of immersive empathy reading a piece of fiction because even if you're reading a news article about something terrible happening or even if you're watching a tv show there's that barrier still but if you're in fiction and especially i write a lot of first person fiction um it's you know, you are looking, I always say when I go to talk to kids, I'm like, reading is magic. Like you're looking at a dead bit of tree and vividly hallucinating. Like it's crazy. <laughs> and you're actually in the head of somebody who doesn't exist and you're feeling their feelings as they feel them and you're experiencing their experiences as you experience them. And the power of that, it's, you know, you're basically tripping your brains off and you can learn so much about the human experience and feel emotions that you never felt. And like, just, to me, that's just where my heart is. Like, look how excited I'm. Like, I love it so much. And <laughs> so, like, that is the medium for me. Um, but that won't be the medium for everyone. People feel that way about poetry, screenplays. It's like, what makes your heart soar? Um, what you'll just feel like, I am on the earth to tell this type of story in this way. And it's finding your own creative sweet spot for you um, and knowing that you're the only person to tell this story in this way because you're you. And if you're getting all that zing, that means that you should be telling that story and it's finding it for you because it's different for everyone. Yeah, that, 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 that really speaks to me. And actually I was, I was on your Twitter feed and I was, I mean, I've looked through a lot of your feedback because I found that really interesting because the passion that came across from the reviews was so much more than I've seen elsewhere. And there's this one quote from someone who read your book and they said, I honestly wish every young woman, let's talk about pretending, I honestly wish every young woman could read this book before she enters the relationship. So she would know what healthy and unhealthy looks like before giving away her heart. This is the best book I've read in a very long time. And I know you touched upon this, um, the psychology, you know, you really like to understand what makes people tick, but I wonder if there's anything else you can tell us about how you create these characters, like the process behind creating the characters and the dialogue. Is it based on real life? Are you stealing conversations from your friends? <laughs> what yeah, inspires I you? I think 
if you're like looking for, you know how like the good, a perfect Victoria sponge recipe is something like 33% butter, 33% flour, 33% sugar, I feel like if you want to be a novelist, it's 33% writing, 33% reading and 33% living, um, you know, just getting out there, taking an evening class and counselling, um, speaking to somebody on the bus, putting yourself out of your comfort zone. And that's hard if you're a writer because my natural inclination is to just sit like Gollum in my room. Like, <laughs> a hermit. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm an introvert. Most writers are. But it's like forcing myself out of that um, because you just need to osmosis life to get ideas and to meet people to maybe understand them, where characters can come from. Um, and so like, yeah, when I write, characters that seem to really connect with people I think hopefully it's because I just go out and unhum it myself as much as possible um but it's also I think having to be honest with yourself um obviously you're drawn to tell particular stories based on the life that you've had the things that have happened to you and I think in order to write good fiction you have to have a good grasp of yourself and not be scared to dive in there, to dive into the darker thoughts that you might have, the darker experiences you might have lived through, the hard conversations that you have with your friends and family. Um, and it's not like write a hidden autobiography, <laughs> which you get thrown at you a lot if you're a writer, especially if you're a female writer. But it's, if I have a thought that makes me uncomfortable, I don't push it away. I'm like, oh, where's that come from? And I kind of spend some time trying to work out why I'm feeling jealous, why I'm feeling insecure, why I'm feeling angry, <laughs> and, then, and dig in that. And then you start finding the fossils of the stories, um, which is what Stephen King says, it's like finding a fossil. Um, so it's about being brave enough to kind of jump into the darker parts of the human experience even if you're writing a comedy because all of us have very complicated quite dark lives all of us have dysfunctional families all of us have probably had dysfunctional relationships all of us feel hugely alone probably about 80 percent of our time it's the human experience is hard um but you can you have to not be scared to go in there if you i believe in order to be creative in a way that's going to really connect people. People want that to be seen, but it's hard. If I'm not terrified, then I think I'm writing crap. If I'm like, it's a, like, I know the good stuff is coming where I'm just going, this is awful. What are people going to think of me if I write this? <laughs> mm. people could, it, I, if I just feel sick, then I know it's a good page. <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah, you have you've you've written things that I don't think I've had the courage to admit even to myself. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've read a lot of psychology books, <laughs> and yeah. I had to have a lot of therapy when I was working for the charity. So um, I do think personal discovery really helps your creativity as well, um, and it's a really beneficial thing to do anyway. Regardless if you want to write, just like understanding yourself better is good for you anyway. Mm. Do you, when you write, and obviously you've written a lot that's resonated with so many people, do you think about the reader when you're writing and like who might be reading this? Is that something that goes through your head while you're writing or is it more in the editing phase? I think, or if at all? I think, I've, I'm sure again that most people in this room have read Stephen King's on writing. Um, and that to me is like my Bible. I reread it at least once a year because I just, always wonder and um I think if he sort of said initially the first draft is like you're telling the story to yourself it is like a fossil you're just trying to dig up and so I think when I'm in first draft land I just to me that's all about overcoming the fear that I think it's rubbish <laughs> um mm. overcoming the boredom after the first 15,000 words where I'm like oh it's, it's the best idea in the world it's amazing and after 15,000 words going, no, this isn't actually very good. And I'm sort of screwing it up. And I've got this other great idea that I actually think, you know, it's going, no, stay true. You used to be excited by this. <laughs> Power on. It's overcoming all those hurdles and trying to get that fossil out of your mind. And to me, that's telling the story to yourself. And it's only when I read back a first draft and I'm like, why is this fossil arrived? <laughs> what is this story? What is it trying to say? What's it trying to 
why did it come out of me? What's going on here? Who's it for? And that's in the editing process. But initially, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Sorry, I, just, I wish I could. Susan, yeah. why, but I just know that you don't know what you're doing until you've finished writing, really, if you mm. write like me. Yeah, and that what you said, it just reminded me, there's another quote I, I, I wrote down that you said um, that sometimes you'll share with writers is to accept that writing a novel is all about ruining the perfect idea you had in your head. Um, is that kind of what you mean by that? Or can you tell us a little more? Of course. Of I remember seeing it, I think it was like a meme on Twitter and it was like, what I think my book will be like. And it's a picture of like The Last Supper. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci was like, and what my book turns out like, and it's just a stick drawing. <laughs> like, drawn on like Microsoft Paint in 1999. <laughs> like these stick figures there. <laughs> and um, I was like, and I think that was like, oh, that is, True, and um, I think, yeah, I do believe that the write, writing fiction is the act of destroying a perfect idea in your head. And I'm sure, as I said, lots of people in this room have had that moment where they have this idea for a story or a character or a poem, screenplay, and they're so excited. Um, and the temptation is to just leave it there as this perfect, unformed, well, when I get the time to write it, it's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be great. because once you start writing it, it will never live up to the hype in your head. And then you might get a different idea or you might get bored of it or you start having plot problems or characters. You're like, oh, I don't even know how I'm going to get this to work. And yeah, so it's accepting the fact that you're going to completely ruin the best idea you ever had. But if you were that excited to begin with, if you were just buzzing when that idea landed, you've got to know that in the translation from head to work there will be enough of that there there will there will you won't ever be able to get 100 percent. there'll be enough and you, be, and you cannot mend a blank page i just say that over and over again when i go into schools just get it written make it terrible ruin it but there will be enough of that initial joy and energy and and you can start finding it, but you can actually find it in this real place, the words on the paper that you made, the download that you, you created. But you cannot do that unless you screwed mm. it up completely to begin with. <laughs> mm. I love that. Yeah, so get it done. And that, and that makes me think of, um, uh, you, you know, the, the process that you, uh, it makes me question the, the process you go through. So I know when you have an idea, you have a concept in your head and you're determined to write it. What is, what time, how long do you allow yourself to write that? And what does that process look like? Is it, is it, are you still doing two hours a day? <laughs> I have, so, and again, this is so different depending on everyone. You know, it's like, it's, the what works for me is definitely what not, will not work for everybody. I know some people who plan every chapter before they write. I'm always in awe of them and quite jealous of them. I'm like, oh, you're a better writer than me because you're so organized. <laughs> um, to me, I have to have the first line. And I could tell you the first line of any of my books. Like, you can test me. I'll be like, I'm there. I know them. <laughs> in the first line is what always arrives. So we're pretending the first line was, I hate men, um, which is one of my favorites. Um, and it is technically hate speech but it is the build up to a joke um and yeah so i have to have the first line and then usually once i've got the first line the concept and what i want to write kind of rushes in and i've got a very vague idea of what i want to explore and what i want to have happen i never know the ending then i research it i research all the stuff and i think having a journalistic background is very useful so i can kind of interview people so for pretending it's about you know a, somebody who survived a rape from a previous boyfriend um that hasn't quite dealt with the trauma and now they're trying to find love kind of five years later but they feel they have to hide this trauma in order to be romantically acceptable so i had to either research like read, read books about trauma uh interview psychotherapists spent a lot of time interviewing survivors like all this stuff to just feed the idea and make sure that when it comes to actually getting to the first draft, 
I'm not losing the rhythm because I'm like, hang on, I don't know anything about PDSD. I should probably go and research that for three weeks and then get back to it. Because I feel like once I land in the first draft, I don't want to do anything apart from write. So I feed myself like a kind of glutton with as much research. Also because I'm delaying starting because it's terrifying <laughs> starting a book. I'm like, oh, I don't want to ruin it. I'm going to ruin it the moment I start it. So I'll just delay it with all this research. And then like a helicopter, finally I land like kind of fat with research and, <laughs> and a very vague idea. And then I just go for it. And I have a daily word count. I do not let myself not meet that word count unless I'm very ill. So Corona has been very useful. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I have a killer virus. I don't have to write today. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but normally I do not let myself go to bed until I've hit that word count and I just keep going and going and going until I hit the end. And I do not read anything back because I know that if I read it back, it'll be dreadful and I'll hate it and I'll lose all of my confidence. And I'm just like, you know, it's dreadful. First drafts always are. Just don't look back, keep going. And so then I just kind of get it out. Um, and that's how I write. It's not very scientific. <laughs> no, and I think that, I mean, Matt and I have, have spoken to, lot, to lots of different writers about their, their style. And we, we've definitely seen a lot of that. that everyone has a different style. Um, but it is really interesting to see how you work. I mean, tw 12 books in seven years. <laughs> it's interesting to see what sits behind that. Um, you, there's definitely a work ethic that you have that I find very interesting. I guess, and I had a question around how you choose the next idea. So what do you, I'm sure you have loads of ideas of what you could work oh, on. I wish, no. No? <laughs> no. My what fear, is that? I, I don't know if you guys are the same, but like my fear always is like, what if I never have another idea for anything ever again? Hmm. Like that is a thought that will float into my brain at like, 11 32 p.m when i'm trying to sleep and then i'm like all oh, right no i'm just gonna be paralyzed with fear um so it's yeah it's and i don't know how you get ideas for books i don't know if you guys know the answer to that but i'm like but it's interesting because i think you've it's interesting so you ask someone who has written one book versus someone who's written 12 books i wonder if it's a, we talk about trading up problems maybe the problem that you the problem you have as a first time writer versus when you're on your sort of trying to think of your 13th, 14th, 15th book, maybe that's the problem that you trade up. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Especially if you're like a brand author, like, you know, I, I, I am like, I like my readers to some degree to know what they're getting. Um, Cause I know I get really pissy when artists that I love suddenly go off piece. I'm like, no, Taylor, yeah. go back to country. <laughs> <laughs> I love Have you ever heard of... <laughs> have you heard of James Altucher? He talks about ideas, like how to exercise the idea muscle. No. He talks about he talks about this concept of every day you just write down ten ideas about any any sort of concept, whether it's uh, ways in which a, a woman falls off a cliff or um, different different ways a mobile phone cover could look. And then you he just says the ideas start mating with each other and generate. <laughs> Again, all ideas. Yeah, <laughs> you, should, uh, you should look it up. To, uh, we'll share the link. It's um, his his theory of how he never runs out of ideas. Mm. I think as um, I always know I've got one because I suddenly just kind of get a bit excited and I've got to write it down. Um, but then it's usually when I'm on a long walk or on a long car drive, the day or two after I've got really upset about something. That seems to be. I, I basically I think if you've had an emotional response to being alive when that you kind of don't just shake off you just really have emoted <laughs> um, that's usually there's something there um so yeah so all of my books have come from some sort of probably negative emotion and then I've kind of erupted and got really upset and not quite understood why. And then I've let myself chill out and ruminate on it. And again, being brave enough to be like, what was going on there, Holly? What was going on? <laughs> um, Just going back to the authentic feeling you talk about, this authenticity, um, being authentic with yourself and asking yourself the hard questions. Yeah. And so with pretending, I am, um, I'd had the really horrible um, altercation with some man at a uh, Victoria train station um, where 
I'd had a really good, nice night out and I was trying to get the last train home and I was a bit jolly because I'd had a few drinks and I was wearing a nice dress and you know when you're just sort of like floating around London feeling a little bit like Harry Bradshaw like in your head you're like oh I could totally be in a film you know just like I was in that sort of jolly mood <laughs> trying to work out the last train home and then some guy came up to me when I was looking at the train and he was like came up to me I thought he needed like information about the trains and he was like oh I, I just want to tell you how beautiful you are and for some reason I just wasn't in the mood for that and wasn't didn't have my defenses up and I just turned around and I just went I don't need to know that you find me attractive like I'm just trying to get home and I did I said it in like a kind way but it was just a bit like I just no like I'm just leave me alone um and he of course like erupted and started swearing at me and calling me a bitch and a hoe and and then followed me into WH Smith to continue telling me why I'm such, you know, and it was almost like the compliment came from a place of hate rather than appreciation. Wow. Um, and it was just awful to the point where I was like crying and begging him to leave me alone. And I was like, I'm in WH Smith. This is my safe space. Like, let me out. And then, and then I was just like furious and like furious and furious and furious. And then got on the train shaking and was like venting to a friend what had just happened. And then I suddenly just got out my laptop in my bag and wrote, I hate men. <laughs> and then like that chapter came and, um, and I just wrote a massive rant. But it was only a couple of days later that I thought of the punchline to the chapter, which is, oh, he's messaged back, never mind. Yes. <laughs> and this idea that you can just be like this raging feminist. And then suddenly the moment a guy that you do like who you would like to tell you is beautiful, um, suddenly messages back and you're like, oh, I don't care. Like it can all go out the window. And, and that's where it came from. So I'm always like mine the complicated emotions. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, that's the behind the scenes story of pretending. <laughs> I owe that dude a drink. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he's on here. Probably not. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, and I have a question because um, so because you write about such real things and, and maybe some uh, traumatic things and raw things, uh, you have a partner. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was, I was curious, does, does your partner re read your books? And if so, like, what's that dialogue like of the either characters or situations, if whatever you want to share with us? It's, um, we're both a very literary couple. Um, and we're like, we're new-ish, we've been together for three years, but we're very happy. I'm so happy. We are. <laughs> it's just like, it can exist. I was so skeptical my whole life. And then I'm like, mm. when you meet someone, you're really happy. You're like, oh, it's real. It's like, this is worth holding out for. Um, but my, one of my biggest anxieties about our relationship was him reading my work. Um, and him maybe thinking it's about him or that I'm putting, like that to me, was was a huge anxiety particularly as I really go there um and I think he's a keeper because he just doesn't think it's about him at all I think I could even like <laughs> call him by his name and he wouldn't he's just like but he's very supportive and even with that first chapter and pretending that I hate men chapter which of course could be quite hard to read if you're a, a man um a man that's dating you <laughs> <laughs> He read it and he was laughing and he's like, oh, you need to put this in there. You need to put that in there. And mm. I was like, oh my God, like, I'm just not going to let you leave me because you're amazing. <laughs> it, and that, you know, to feel free to be creative. And um, I remember seeing there was like a Twitter storm like a couple of weeks ago about whether or not your partner should read your work or respect your work and what that mm. means about your relationship. And I don't think it matters if your partner read things or not but I think they need to take it seriously I think mm. it would be bad to be if you're creative and somebody's like oh you're doing your little thing or you're doing your little writing or you're doing your poetry like to kind of diminish that in any way I, I that's the only thing where I, like, I have a strong opinion because <laughs> mm. being wanting to tell your story in whatever form that takes is the most powerful human urge and it takes so much bravery and so anyone that you're close to that you love should be going tell your story like that's amazing like I love that you want to be creative I think that's incredible and I, I think that that's the only thing I have to say about that hmm. it sounds like a keeper well 
yeah, we'll see. I mean, we're in lockdown <laughs> together, so God knows what will happen. Yeah, accelerated <laughs> relationship. Yeah. Uh, we probably have time for one more question from us, Paolo, and then we'll open up, up to the group. Do you, do you want to ask something, Paolo? Um, just one quick question about um, promotion of your work, because for a lot of, some writers enjoy it more than others how how do you approach it like do you do you find that you have to do a lot of work when your book does come out and you, and you have to get it out there is it something you enjoy um i what? yeah when i have a book out i am a mixture of really happy and giddy and also like the grumpiest cow um so going on tour and meeting readers is amazing getting to do something like this where I just get to talk about work and books with people who don't get bored <laughs> like the amount of dinner parties where I'm like oh, have you read the latest this and that da, 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 da. and oh well it was done in third person narrative isn't that interesting and they're just like I'm an accountant like shit <laughs> like so getting to like <laughs> geek out with my people is just a joy and then having readers who you know have like had maybe made life changes because of my books like my first adult book how do you like me now like that has ended a lot of relationships like in a good way like I've had people come up to me and be like I cancelled my wedding after reading your book and uh, wow. <laughs> wow which was my hope when I wrote it <laughs> and not in a I you know love stinks way but just like people need to save their hearts to the people who respect them and love them in a healthy way so I love all that but as I said, I am a bit like a hermit golem. And so everything around tour, I hate. So I hate being away from home. I hate being in hotels. I hate just being on a train. I just, I, yeah, I'm like, I'm quite happy in lockdown because if, <laughs> you know, as long as I, you know, get a green space to walk in, like being in my house and just not having to go out there into the big bad world is nice. Mm. So I'm, I find promotion amazing and also hugely difficult. And my publishers are very good at understanding that I'm quite a highly sensitive person. And so they do things like I never away more than three nights at a time. And then I have to like come home and recharge like an iPhone mm -hmm. and then I can go back out again. But you hear people in America as well, um, pretending is coming out in America in the fall. And they were like, well, you're a debut. So we might not tour you until your second book. And I'm like, thank because <laughs> you hear that you get flown to a different state every day and I, oh I would just be crying constantly just it's my worst nightmare so um mm. I think most writers struggle with promotion because it goes against what makes you a writer which is being quite into the liking your home comforts it, it's it doesn't tend to go with being very outlandish and spontaneous and I don't know in my experience most hmm. yeah that, may, that makes okay. sense <laughs> great well we're gonna open it up to the group and see what questions we have so if everyone wants to go back into the chat box um, not everyone has to ask a question but if you do have a question put it in the chat box and then we'll call on a handful of you uh, you have the option you can ask the question yourself uh, if you like or we can ask it on, on your behalf uh, which might mean you need to unmute yourself. Um, and then also, uh, we are going to pick uh, two people at, at random who ask a question and, and we'll give you a, a copy of Holly's book. Um, yeah, so that's incentive to uh, ask something. Uh, so we've got a, a couple questions. Uh, and so we'll, uh, uh, Love, uh, would you like to ask your question? Um, hello, I would love to. Um, so I was just wondering, um, well, first of all, um, this talk was amazing. Um, I was just wondering, when you write um, and you're not sure how clear you are about expressing the different characters and everything, do you ever ask friends for opinion or who do you actually ask for an opinion to, to see what kind of emotion your work has evoked? Okay. Um, so again, it's what you find works for you. So all I can say is what works for me, but Stephen King's on writing is my Bible. And he always says you write the first draft of the door closed. It's just you and your world. And you've 
it is like a giant game of chicken with yourself because you do start doubting things and like, oh, maybe this character isn't this or maybe this character isn't that or maybe this isn't coming across. And I do agree with him that if you can to stay in that fear and to keep the door closed, because the problem is opinions will sway you and you might end up not telling the story you wanted to tell and you might not really understand what you're doing until you've finished it and had a chance to read it back. So I write a full draft by myself and it's lonely and I hate it. And all I want to do is share it with my agent or my partner or my parents and be like, tell me this is it rubbish or this and that. And I am like, no, because that will be noise and that will interfere with me and the story. I've got to paddle to the other side of this ocean alone. And then I go in and do a whole draft, like reread it back. And then I open the door and let people's opinions and then I feel strong enough that their opinion, I know the story well enough and that they won't sway me from the foundations of what I'm trying to do. So if they're like, oh, I really don't like that character. I don't understand that. I'll know then, no, you're wrong. Or, oh, that, that makes sense because the story's finished. But I can only talk for myself. Like some people do share drafts halfway and encourage each other but I've only ever found that made me flounder rather than helped me thank you <laughs> um Jess you had a question I don't know if there's more than one Jess Jess you had a question about the relationship with the publisher would you like to unmute yourself yeah um so I'm just curious as to how you have a relationship with your publisher what that looks like on a practical strategic point of view um, and then also going back to what we were talking about earlier about pitching your brand, creating that brand and how you have something that's very identifiable, but for someone that may not yet have that, that doesn't have the decadive experience, how do you go about creating that? And then um, what role does the publisher play in that process as well? Oh, um, it's hard with brands and I didn't understand mine until actually my publisher sent me on a three day branding workshop. And um, so that is where, <laughs> you know, the kind of corporate machine kicks in and you're like, oh, I just wrote a book, I don't know. Um, and they're kind of vet, then that, that to some degree, it's knowing that that's what publishers are there to do is to kind of start doing this and that. And so it's not so much your concern as a writer when you start pitching to agents and, and they start pitching that's their job to some degree and then as I said they sent me away on a like this weird retreat where I had to work out what my brand was and you had to like but the one thing they did say is you have to like condense yourself or your story into three words like have three key things um, and I think mine was humor and telling the truth and understanding young people because I work and to be fair that is actually what I still do um in terms of when you do start pitching to agents the one thing that I think they find really helpful and I find helpful when I start a, so I have to still pitch a book to an agent and my publishers I'm like I want to write this and sometimes they're like that no <laughs> and they still veto me and you still get rejected a lot but um I try to write the book into one page, but what they really like at the beginning is like two sentences and they really like a, it's like this meets this. And that's the, like, so um, with this, I pitched it is, it's like how to lose a guy in 10 days meets killing Eve. It's like revenge fantasy and, and stuff. And like suddenly they've got these two, it's like, it's like working out what book your mashup is. Um, my friend Ellie has just written an incredible memoir that's just been published called Staunch and they described it as wild meets the best exotic marigold hotel because she goes to India on holiday with her like three grand like her grandma her other grandma and her great auntie and she's like in India with like people in their 80s and has this like and so it's like oh it's like wild but with old people and um, so that two things is what kind of they're looking for but then their job is to yeah kind of make you a bit of a brand um which I find uncomfortable <laughs> I just want to tell stories but then that's their job 
So it's just like knowing what you're good at. Your job is to tell the story the best as you can to the best of your ability. And then it's their job to kind of make you sparkly and slick. <laughs> Great, thanks, Holly. Um, Emma, you had a question about character development. Would you like to ask that? Hi. Yeah, I'd love to know more about your character development um, in terms of do you, how fully flesh are your characters before you start writing because you said about sort of feeding yourself with research before you start writing but I just wonder how much do you feed yourself with the details of your characters or do you just have a sense of them and you start writing and they sort of unearth themselves as you go um it is the second for me and again there's lots of writers that work the other way so they do just sort of I write have the stage and then the characters just kind of come on and just do their own thing and like I always like makes me feel like a crazy person but there's enough of all as you say that it works the same way um the things like in pretending like they both watch loads of Dawson's Creek and I've never watched Dawson's Creek so then I was suddenly having to like watch Dawson's Creek so I was like well I have to keep up with my characters they know all the stuff that I do and so they I don't even know where that came from it then that's why I find Stephen King's fossil analogy really helpful because it's just part of the fossil was they binge watch Dawson's Creek and I was like okay that's happening I'm just going to ride this train and now I have to watch Dawson's Creek because my characters have told me to um in terms of making them believable in their development that comes out in the edit and that's when I would really recommend the book uh, The Science of Storytelling um, where he talks about the fatal flaw and how all of us to some degree have a fatal flaw and that's where all our the stories of our lives come from is us trying to overcome that. And to me, the most important thing is anyone in my writing, not just my main character, I want to know what everyone's fatal flaw is. Even like the person who's losing her coffee in for a sentence in one scene, I'm like, what's going in? Even if it doesn't even make it on the page, I'm like, what's going in their head in that day? And I feel like if you just are colouring in that background noise, so you can kind of, explain what the barista's parents are like <laughs> it just okay. it enriches it in some way but as I said making characters real is about digging up the dirt and the darkness because that's human life you don't have to always put it there but it's but usually the character will tell you I find if you just yeah. in the edit it I'm like why are you here why have you just turned up and taken up three scenes and after a while they're like because of this and you're like oh okay <laughs> That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got one question from Amira that I'll ask on her behalf. Um, when do you know that your draft is ready to be shared? I think that is a really hard thing for any writer. Is like, when do you let go? Um, especially, as I said, the art, to me, the art of creation is ruining a perfect idea, but you kind of want to make it as perfect as you can. And it's... Um, I, as I said, I write a first draft in total fear completely by myself and then I edit a draft and I do a really really heavy line edit in that um, and again I kind of use a lot from like the science of storytelling where it's like visually if you're a human how would you experience this scene and make sure every sentence is geared to how a human would experience it's like so there's a lot of science um, and also journalistic values my journalism training to make sure that any flabby word is out anything that's not forwarding the plot is out um, so by the end of that process, I have a very slickly written, probably mess of a draft, if that makes sense. But I've got enough of the idea and I know that it's not being lost in silly language, flowery language. And then I give it, then I open the door and um, let go of it. But to me, once a book has been published, I am so bored of it. I just can't stand the sight of it. I just, I've read it so many times. That there's nothing about redrafting something again and again to just make you just not care anymore. And then again, you've got another idea, hopefully. I call it the slutty meal idea. She's like, hi, Holly, you want to write me? I'm so much more fun than your other idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like chasing her like a prick. Just like going, oh, I'm bored of this book. And um, so there's nothing like getting under a new <laughs> story to get over the one that you've been telling get excited by something else and then you can let it go and you have to let it go at some point because that's when the magic happens between the reader and 
you. You have to let it go in order for that connection to take place. But it's scary. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Right. So I think we're at time. It's eight o'clock. And Holly, I want to, to honor your, your evening and your time. Um, so we're going to wrap. Uh, before you do, there's a couple questions that might be rapid fire. The first okay. is your first uh, book. How many agents did you have to reach out to before you found one you were happy to work with? You're going to hate me and I'm going to say it was my first, but that was <laughs> only because I researched and researched and researched and read every article online a million times about how to get an agent and didn't, you only get one shot to make first impression. And so it was like the best covering letter in the world. Um, so get the writers and artists yearbook and make it your Bible. Mm. And then I promise you, you've got a really good shot at hearing back from your top agent. Mm. Thanks. And then one more, maybe a quick question. Do you work on one book at a time? So this is from Nancy, or are there a couple of things that you're working on at once? Um, I am only ever writing one book at a time. I could never back to me. I, I would just, I find it, I get so grumpy anyway. <laughs> writing <laughs> one book, sorry that Nancy. Sometimes I'm having to edit a book um, that I've already written, like I'm going to do line edits and I'm writing a new one, but that, the, the act of creation has already happened and it's just refining mm -hmm. it. But I could never, I'm again in awe of people who can. It's like, oh, I just did an adult book this morning and then I did some poetry in the evening. I'm like, you're amazing. I could never do that. <laughs> oh, great. Um, so, Parwell, do you have uh, any names in mind of who, who to give the book to? <laughs> Um, yes, we've got we've got two um, digital books that we'll send, so it doesn't matter where you're based. Um, so, Karen, um, you just have to uh, DM us your email address, and we'll send you a digital copy. Um, and and Grace, Great. so two uh, digital copies. Uh, we also do have the links for uh, Holly's books which we will share with you mm -hmm. i'm just going to put put the links in and then maybe got... yeah and maybe courtney if i don't know if we can send a, a note to everyone at least people who came from the writer's salon uh we'll send you an email with all resources and we'll share that with you courtney if you can send that on to any albright yeah. uh, members Absolutely, as well. we'd be delighted to yeah any links uh, that we've talked about any books we've talked about we'll send that in a follow-up yep i have we'll everyone that. from albright um email address that I can just send out something to. Great. Great. Excellent. Um, oh, thank you for letting me whisper on. I feel very full talking to about books oh. for an hour. <laughs> thank you so much, Holly. It's, it's really been a pleasure. An incredible yeah. Tuesday evening. Thank you. Yeah. And just get writing, everybody. Just write, write, write. <laughs> yep. Excellent. If anyone wants help writing, we do. We run something called Writer's Hour every weekday morning from 8 to 9 a.m. Uh, where we just do a Zoom room and we sit down and write. So it might be your most productive hour of the of the week. Yeah, and uh, Holly, so Holly might join us. I might, wow. yeah, when I can stop That'd using be... Corona as an excuse. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a, a couple of final shout outs just before we go. Matt, shall I do a few yeah. shout outs? Um, so, so Holly supports um, Women's Aid Charity. Um, so if you go to womensaid.org.uk, um, is there anywhere in particular you think anything that you would like to push any campaign that you're particularly supporting at the moment and domestic violence is unfortunately going through the roof um, in lockdown situations so I know everyone's hurting for money at the moment but if you could just bang a tenner anything you can spare towards women's aid they really need it right now because um, it's a dangerous time um, in that regard just yeah another horrible side effect of lockdown um, but yeah, the women's odor are amazing and they're a safe place to donate to. Great, and we'll share that in the link tomorrow. Um, yeah. as, we, as Holly's book is out, it's out in the UK right now. The US, it's coming out. In fall, um, yeah, fall, which in is- the fall, In the fall, autumn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she became an American then. <laughs> I know what that means. <laughs> uh, excellent, well, thank you, thank you so much, Holly. Um, it's you. really been a pleasure. Please continue to self-care and rest and sleep and keep writing for all thank of us. Thank you so much. I had such a great time. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the writers who came along. Would, would we like to unmute ourselves and give a round of applause to Holly and for us for showing up? Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Oh, I can see everyone. This is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> keep writing, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely uh, evening. Have a lovely evening, guys. See some of you tomorrow so morning. Bye. Uh,
Thanks, Bye. everyone. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.